I don't know what I'm going to say, and therefore it'll probably be um, difficult for you to understand what I'm saying, but one thing I do know, and that is I am absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Graham Johnston. Uh, I'm a patient. I've got rheumatoid arthritis. And I was thinking back, it's more than eight years ago that um, I'd got involved with um, one of the companies that makes a rheumatoid arthritis drug on their scientific advisory board. And their chief sort of patient person, Lord de Wolf, said, would I like to come along to a meeting? Well, it wasn't really a meeting. It was a super lo a dinner in London. Uh, and I met some nice people from some pharma companies, people like um, Tony Hoos, who's sitting there, uh, Gene Regnanti, Roz Schneider. I didn't know it then, but I was dining with giants. This, these were leaders in the whole field of patient engagement, and they had me along as a patient. And we talked about... The fact that the EMA and the FDA were both making very obvious signs that they were going to start having expectations from pharma for engaging patients in a formal, structured way. And lots was going on, but there was nothing formal, there was nothing structured, and there was a great unmet need for coordination. And we talked about that, and I was there as the only patient, which was far-sighted, but actually hopeless, because one patient was never enough. And we started having more regular meetings and phone conversations, and that's when other people got brought in. People like Jan Giesler, people like Mark Bhutan, people like Ronnie Tadaro, other patients from, with different backgrounds got brought into that whole process. And out of that came PFMD. Now, that was 2014 edging into 2015. And we set off with great pace and great ambition. And that's when I became aware that there was so many other things going on in the environment. There was UPATI, there was FPA, there was uh, the European Patients Federation. There was all sorts of things going on. And this thing called PIOF sprang up. I don't think it's a very good name because in, in English it sounds like you're swearing, but it, uh, we'll, let, we'll, we'll let that pass. Uh, um, this PIOF thing sprang up and, and people like you were all coming together and, and making things happen. There was, there was this strand and this strand. And to me, it was a bit like you know, there was some carbon over here and some hydrogen there and some oxygen there. And these different groups were all coming up with formulations and there was other little elements being thrown into the mix. And Piof was the catalyst where they all come together. And you know what happens when you get carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and other elements? Suddenly, you're talking carbohydrates. Suddenly, you're talking big molecules and important things. And in... Intellectual terms, that's what happens when this whole uh, PR thing gels and happens. And my exhortation to you all, we're embarking today on 48 hours of working together. When we're in sessions and when we're chatting over coffee or wine or beer or whatever, we're all embarking on something. And this coming together is a catalyst to try and make things change because so much has been achieved so far. But can you really look at the landscape and say, tick, we have done that? No, of course you can't. There's so much more to do. And I've got huge ambition for patient engagement to be much, much more widespread, much better known. And I want, I feel like, I told you I felt like I was with the giants and I've been standing on their sh shoulders. But I want this group to be seen as formulative and, and visionary. And in five years' time, you'll look back and say, I was at Piof in Barcelona in 2022. And so much has changed since then. It was such a kickoff point, such a launch pad. And that will only happen if you guys throw yourselves into it with enthusiasm, bring your experience, bring your brains, bring your complaints, argue on stage and on screen. There's five people far better able than me to talk about why it matters to them and what we're going to do. And the first of those is Lara. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name's Lara Bloom, and I'm the president and CEO of the Airless Danlos Society. I also wear a few other hats. I'm on the board of directors with IAPO, the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, a global strategic advisor for global genes, and a uh, professor of practice in patient engagement and global co uh, collaboration at Penn State College of Medicine. So I, I love, patient engagement is the world I, I live in. I love that we're here talking about this. I think it's important. 
I think we've reached a moment um, with patient engagement where it's time to question, is it being done in the right way? Are we going in the right direction? How can we improve things? Because finally, it's something that seems to be more of a given um, than something that you see now and then. But um, I'd like to challenge where we're at a little bit over the next few days, because I think we could go further and do more. Well said. The uh, next person I'd like to bring in, just because she's not in the room, and it's unfortunate that she can't be, but we're absolutely delighted that she can make it. Uh, we've got Maria Mavris from EMA uh, on screen. Maria, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Graham. And it's um, really, it's a pleasure to be joining virtually, and uh, it would have been great to be there in person and seeing actually probably quite a few familiar faces. So I can only echo what Lara has said as well and say that uh, from a personal point of view, patient engagement is, is incredibly important. And I uh, started my experience with patient engagement when I was working for Eurodis, the rare disease organization, and that's how I got to know EMA. Mm -hmm. And uh, with my experience of working with EMA via Eurodis and involving patients, then I came over to EMA, firstly on secondment, and now I've been employed where I get to continue to ensure that the patient voice is included all along the medicine's regulatory life cycle. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk more about that, but I'll leave that there for now. But uh, I, I agree that it's going to be great and dynamic uh, 48 hours, and it would have been great to have been there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, uh, it is a shame that you're not with us, but can I say again how grateful we are that you've, you've come along today uh, because uh, your support is, is very important to us. Uh, the next person we have is, is you, Stuart, Stuart Faulkner. Hi, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stuart Faulkner. I'm a researcher from the University of Oxford in, in UK. Um, I come from being involved in the Paradigm Project for which the, the, the P-Off was a, was a legacy piece. So I, I, I've seen this sort of develop from, from the beginning. Um, I, guess, I guess what excites me at the moment is, is, is two things. We've We've had sort of two, two and a half years where patient engagement has been very disrupted. Um, a lot of patient engagement that has gone on may have been done remotely, it may have been done hybrid, it may have stopped altogether. So I think for me, I'm excited really to take stock of those two and a half years and just think about what has worked well and perhaps what has not worked quite so well and share those learnings when patient engagement is done face-to-face, -face, when it's done hybrid, when it's done remotely. Um, and I think we really have an opportunity to, to really create some, uh, some principles about how we could think about that moving forward because we are face-to-face -face now, but whether we remain face-to-face -face as a way of working or hybrid as a way of working moving forward, is, I think is still, still questionable. And I think building on that, I'm also excited to see about where this, where this P-off goes next over the next couple of years. How can we then expand? How can we reach different populations, different geographies, using those different modes of engagement with the community? So whether that's face-to-face, -face, whether that's hybrid, whether that's remote, and how we can blend those together to really expand that patient engagement to a much more global audience and really utilize utilise those methods as best possible. So those are the things that I'm excited about for, for these two and a half days. I think that's great, Stuart. And uh, if I could draw one thread out of that, that I'd like us to bear in mind going forward. This idea about patient engagement and even interaction in groups like this, whether it's... Uh, to me, it's undoubted there has been remarkable success in maintaining some momentum through the pandemic because of meeting virtually. But I'd like to also consider what we lose, both in meetings like this, but also in wider patient engagement by only doing it virtually. Because one of the things I remember that really gave an impetus to six or seven senior figures from the world of pharma who had huge competing interests to be careful about was getting to know each other personally, getting to know the person rather than the job title and being able to trust each other and build that. And the interaction that we, I hope, can strike up as a group over the next two days by actually being together rather than just being, as Jean Giesler would call it, zombies looking at a Zoom screen for hours on end, uh, that is also important. And uh, I, 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 I want us to think about what we have lost and what we need to recapture about intimacy and uh, getting to know each other as people 
as a, a mechanism for driving uh, future development. The next person that I'm going to ask to speak is, is Amanda. Over to you. Thank you for the introduction and for the energetic opening, which I think is what we all needed after lunch. Better than a coffee. Um, so my name is Amanda, and I am the CEO of the European Hemophilia Consortium. I've been in this role for a decade. I first joined Hemophilia four years prior to that at a global level. Um, so I'm very much a patient representative of my disease area. I don't have the disease myself. I have other diseases. That's another story. Um, and so I come at this with a slightly different perspective to many of you, perhaps a, a broader systems perspective. What I'm excited about is that you, the coming together, as you've put, of all of these rivers of effort that we've kind of done independently of each other in, in the patient engagement space, um, meeting in this room and seeing what can bubble out of that. Um, it's important to know that when you work in hemophilia, you're, you're probably in the rare disease group, you're the spoiled golden child because there's a lot out there for us. We have a lot of therapeutic options. The market is very large compared to other rare diseases. Um, but the flip side of that is that we see the other part of the spectrum. We see well beyond post-launch. Um, and what I'm excited about is the conversations that are on the agenda for these 48 hours um, that talk more about the patient and the patient organization role in that post-launch part, not just the HTA, but the payer part, which is something that we ourselves are heavily engaged in, and the shaping of the health system, particularly with ATMPs, Advanced Therapeutic Medicinal Products, coming along and the changes that that will require. So that's what I'm excited to talk about. Um, and what I'm really hoping to see in the next decade is that we uh, collectively move from a piece of patient engagement, which at the moment is largely individual patient engagement, um, as, as we all know, to patient organizations as a sector. And that's something that we have to do is to define what kind of animal we are in the nonprofit space and further formalize and make more official the way that we interact with all stakeholders as a sector and therefore legally mandated, therefore also publicly funded to the more ad hoc structures that we all struggle with right now, which really hamper and impede our ability to be as effective and as credible as I think we all agree is within our potential. So it's a lot of um, structural things that I'd like to see happen. And hopefully they will be born this week. This week. Well, I think it's brilliant that you come in with such a clear agenda. And, uh, and I hope all of you, I hope all of you thought as you were traveling here to Barcelona from wherever, what do I want to get out of it? What, what points do I want to get across? Because I, 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 just to, uh, as we've heard, I think that's so important to actually generate that, that, that debate. Um, f finally, uh, in this phase, we come to someone who, uh, to me, needs no introduction, but that I'm sure is the case of most of us, but someone who neatly straddles the patient world and the uh, world of pharma in a fairly unique way. Mark Bhutan. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Um, first of all, it's great to see all of you in person and to hear from our colleagues here on the stage. I, I am one of those interesting people who spent 25 years as a patient advocate and then uh, it'll be two years, the end of this month, uh, went to Novartis to work in industry. And I wanted to take a minute and just explain why. Um, 25 years ago, and many of you know this, so apologies, but 25 years ago, over a period of just four months, everyone in my family was diagnosed with a different disease. And unfortunately, over a period of about two years, I lost all of them. And I lost all of them for two reasons. One, there were no effective treatments for their condition. And on the other side, there were highly effective treatments, but they couldn't get access to them. And for me, patient engagement has been intensely personal. During the period when they were dying, I myself was diagnosed with cancer for the first time, since been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. So I've lived this as a family caregiver, and as a patient. 
and like many of you in the room, understand that health too often is done to people, not with people. That's the fundamental difference we want to get at. And I know the patient community in Europe and the patient community in the US we're working on this at the same time to drive our regulators to really engage patients in a very, very different way. And we saw EMA take this up, we saw the FDA take it up, and it became a calling. And we've now seen industry take this up, and we've seen a great deal of changes. However, we have not created the impact that I think we all want. We're sort of at a precipice right now where tremendous work has been done but we need to engineer patient engagement as a movement, as a fundamental principle of our entire health ecosystem so that we're focused on co-creation of medicines, but also focused on the co-creation of the entire health ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, I want all patients to be able to say, for somebody like me, with my condition or conditions for most people, I want these outcomes given these circumstances and my life goals. Currently, we cannot do that. But true patient engagement is going to get us to a place where we recreate healthcare, but through the lens of patients. And we make it sustainable, and we do it through co creation. So I have big aspirations for this. We've done a tremendous amount of work. But we still have a lot more to go to really pull this through and ingrain it in the health ecosystem. Thank you, Mark. Um, I was going to ask um, each of you questions about what it is you, um, you're bringing with you. And I think I'd like to ask you just to follow on when you're on a lovely flow like that. Coming into this couple of days, what's, your, what's the number one thing in your agenda that you hope to achieve uh, to take patient engagement as you see it forward? At Novartis, we're looking to hire um, a couple of new people in patient engagement. And one of the things that really struck me, Graham, is I got hundreds of resumes with people, patient engagement at the top of their resume. And really what they meant was marketing. <laughs> You're all chuckling because you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about, right? That's not patient engagement. Now, patient engagement can inform marketing, but they are not the same thing. I, I share that because we've hit this point where it is fun, exciting, there's some sex appeal around patient engagement. That's great. Everybody wants a piece of it. We need to make sure that we move patient engagement to a profession, a discipline, with criteria around it so that when people talk about patient engagement, they understand what it truly is and we're able to execute on it. So for me, what I want to get out of this is how do we move from where we are now? Again, from a place of success, tremendous success, but how do we take it to the next level? Any thoughts on that from what Mark just said? Can I come in on that? Please. Because I completely agree. Um, but what I would add, well, not but, but and, and what I would add to it is that when we want to take patient engagement to that next level and professionalize it, we have to start looking at who are the groups that are doing the patient engagement and are we okay with it being individual patients and in a new disease area, do you find a naive patient, naive in the sense that they haven't been trained necessarily in how to engage with stakeholders and they're only representing their own perspective and not necessarily the perspective of others in their community who of course will differ or do we want patient organizations and how can we ensure that we have a metric for those patient organizations mm -hmm being the way the EMA does it, for instance, you, you have a certain level of criteria in order to be eligible to participate. Um, but at that level of certain criteria to be eligible to engage, mm -hmm. because you know that you're bringing the voice of the community rather than the voice of a subpopulation of individual patients that don't necessarily bring the perspective or the reality uh -huh. of the entire group. Totally with you, and we, we've only just met, um, but in my background, um, I was the CEO of the National Health Council in the US, which was an umbrella patient organization, and you just articulated a lot of the work 
we focused on, on driving uh, the capabilities and capacities of patient organizations. So I'm totally with you. I would add, we still need to engage people living with diseases, so different methodologies for different purposes, but absolutely agree. We have to have the capabilities and capacities of the patient organizations because they're the ones who understand, to your point, the spectrum of life cycle implications, subpopulation implications of people living with a disease, and can give you a very holistic view. So totally with you. Could but, I just oh, yeah, go please, on. No. Sorry. No, I, I, I love hearing this because I think it, that there's so much more um, that could be done. But to me, and, and lived experience, still when you're sitting around a table um, and, and you have a patient expert or a patient voice around the table, more often than not, they're not seen as equal stakeholders. Yeah. It's, it's like, oh, okay, that's the patient voice. And people aren't reimbursed equally. Um, they're not credited equally on publications. And you're, you don't see them through the entire cycle from you know, conception right through to, to post-launch post, um, and, and delivery. And I think that it's still a tick box. It's got much mm. better but to me, what I would like to get over uh, through the next few days is thinking about the terminology. Because you're only a patient when you're in front of a doctor. Right. And you're so much more than a patient when you're bringing... You're an expert. You mm. could be an expert caregiver. You could be a yep. partner. You could be a, a sibling. It's not always the person living with the condition. And the, the association of the word patient is that you need to be cared for, that mm. you are you know, the, the one that is looking up to the other experts mm -hmm. around the table. But then I argue with myself against this because we've come such a long way where the term patient engagement, you know, patient centricity, patient experts, all of these things are now respected globally. Mm -hmm. So by expanding the term, changing the term, you also then take yourself right. backwards because right. we have come such a long way. But in, you know, looking at the organizations, the word patient is in all of them, patient organizations. But we, we are so much more than just a patient. And I think mm. that that really needs to be explored and broadened. And that's what I would love to see, those conversations coming out of the next few days. One of the things that I've experienced is this question of, um, of being, as, you know, that's the patient. Uh, and um, I've had the pleasure of working with someone who said one day, you know, I get really upset about this because there's all these people, all these academics, they've all got PhDs. I've got a PhD too, a person having the disease. And this was meant as a rhetorical point, but it was also meant as that gives me an insight which your years of study, you have maybe, if, if you're a doctor, you may study rheumatoid arthritis for at best one week of your entire, or inflammatory arthritis for one week in your medical degree. Compare that with someone who's had the disease for 15 years and knows its ups and downs and knows the side effects and the triggers and all that. There is real value in, in having a PhD and having the disease. But, uh, but, but there's a, a, a lot more to it than that. Um, I know that, uh, Nicholas, you and your colleagues in the front row want to come in. Would this be a good time to bring you in for some, some thoughts? If you could just um, introduce yourselves. Three more people who have been very important to setting up this uh, two-day session or three-day session. Thank you so much um, for all these insights. I'm happy to be here on behalf and with my colleagues from the P of Steering Committee. My name is Maria Dutarte and I'm from UPATI. I wanted to say also welcome on from my side and share some insights of the Patient Engagement Open Forum as the success story it has been. But next slide, please. So we are now well into the fifth year of the Open Forum. And it, we have seen it grow and develop uh, tremendously from this uh, small-scale conference that it was when it was launched uh, in, within the framework of the IMI paradigm project. Uh, and now it, it is this global multi-stakeholder platform, this phenomenon that really reaches out to millions of people today. And you can see some of the figures here. And now it's been taken forward by uh, three of us, the EPF, PFMD, and UPATI. And while we are evolving this concept and reaching large audiences, 
the, the main purpose still remains. There is this need for the, the platform like this, working together and in a multi-stakeholder context, collaborate on practical solutions in patient engagement initiatives. Next slide, please. Um, and while these virtual sessions in the past two years have really allowed us to reach this wide audience and wide reach, uh, in, it is this, um, these kind of in-person meetings like today that allow us to, to really um, create the, this collaboration, concrete collaboration and hands-on practical workshopping um, possible. So we are very happy to see very diverse representation today among you, um, uh, representatives of all the different stakeholders. Um, amazingly, over 30, uh, 65 organizations represented among the audience, and you can see the, the different groups um, represented. Patients, industry, academia, but also regulators, uh, and representatives of HDA bodies and many other different types of organizations. So welcome to all of you. Hi everybody, it's really feel good to, to have you here. To, it has been a long time, I've not met uh, many of you and so uh, I'm Nicholas Brook for those that don't know me yet. Uh, it will be solved by the end of the three days, I hope. Um, so really happy to be with you uh, today. Uh, so we had a great uh, setting the scene panel um, and I think super ambitious and I think we also all know that we will either succeed together or we will fail as individual or as individual organization. The, the problems that have been articulated here on stage are actually way beyond the potential of one organization to solve and so we are here and we wanted from the beginning to set to design actually a different way to address these issues. Uh, and so there are plenty of conferences, but we wanted to do a different conference. And not really a conference, a co-creation moment for three days. Uh, it has been an invitation only because we had some limitations in uh, what we can organize. But if you are here, it's because you are part of this very close community that want to work together and actually solve these issues that we have just heard about. And so, there are a few keywords uh, on the slide uh, to play with, but really it's about uh, working together and actually find a way where we can also disagree. And so it's, it starts with united. It doesn't mean united and all agreeing on everything. It's united in finding the solutions that uh, we want to, to, to design together. So that's the type of uh, the keywords that you should have in mind. And actually, we have been working super hard and there is like a lot and the team has done a fantastic job. The teams uh, have done a fantastic job to actually design this uh, conference. So actually, now it's about you and what you will do in the sessions, but also at the coffee breaks. We have created the space for you to be at ease. We have not done that in the center of Barcelona because we want you to stay together for three days. Um, and so, uh, so voila, we have designed all of that. And next slide, please. We have a first also uh, what uh, we call the collaborative leadership card. And it's the first version of it. We wait uh, feedback from you on that too. But like the do's and don'ts, what it looks like to, collab to collaborate together, what it doesn't look like. Uh, you have all received that into your welcome bag, and so feel free to, to, to build on that, to use it, uh, and also to give us feedback for the next session, because we, indeed, we hope to, to build that movement. We hope this is actually the kickoff of a, a global movement for patient engagement with all stakeholders on board. Thank you, Nicolas, and I'm Valentina Stramiello from the European Patients Forum. If you can move to the next slide. We wanted to make a few acknowledgements. First of all, we wanted to thank our P of Trendsetters, who are the members of our program committee. Several of them are here today, and feel free to approach them if you want to influence the program of next year, the P of that we are going to organize next year. Feel free to approach them, because uh, they will be happy to collect your ideas as well. Next one, please. And this is to acknowledge our sponsors. This event could have not been possible without their, their support. So we are thankful. We are aware that, I mean, it cannot be given for granted. But this support was really fundamental to make this event possible. Thank you. 
move. And I with this, I will leave the floor to Elizabeth to uh, give some tech information about practicalities. Thank you, Valentina. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Priest. I know that I know some of you, not all of you, but I'm pretty sure your email boxes know me. Um, so if I can get the next slide, just going to go through some really quick housekeeping for you guys, and then we'll turn it back to Graham and our amazing panel here. Um, really quickly, we have 48 hours of a jam-packed schedule. We're really excited to have you guys here, and as uh, Nicola and, and our steering committee mentioned, we, this is very much a co-creation moment. So we ask that you participate. Uh, what you get in is what you get out. This aren't gonna be sessions where you can just come in and watch. Um, they're very much for you to participate. Everyone is a workshop style. Uh, so we do ask that you please go to the sessions. We have the schedule printed on the back of your name tag. And your sessions that you have elected to go to or have been allocated to are highlighted. So if you need any help at all with the schedule, the sessions, the locations, et cetera, please take advantage of our welcome desk that we have out front. Daniela, Giovanni, and the team are going to be there directing you however you need. Um, some quick things about this evening and tonight. We have our parallel sessions now. And then we do have an activity and happy hour on the roof just above this auditorium here at 5.30. After that, we will have a group dinner in the main building across the street. Uh, for those in the Lost in Translation session after this, it is in the other building, so we'll have someone just outside here who can help walk you over. Uh, next slide. Other than that, we have a lot going on. So in addition to the sessions, please take advantage of some of the boards that we have out front. It's very casual, grab a pen, write on it. We have a start, stop, continue board where we hope to get your feedback throughout the whole event. Um, if you have something you want us to know, we'll be checking it daily. Please give us your ongoing feedback about how you think we're doing. In addition to that, we have some areas for the book of good practice, a patient experience data navigator, clinical trial distribution network. So please wander, look around, and actively write on some of those boards that we have out there. Very lastly, we do have uh, the kind of platform that is enabling all of this, which is Synapse. On your name tags, you all should have a QR code. We're very fancy now, we're getting better. <laughs> you can scan the QR code with your phone and that will take you to your Synapse profile. Um, we know that we're using Synapse to, to network and help out, but we know that our memory with passwords is not always the best. So if you need any help at all, resetting your password, resetting your account, anything like that, please, we have a sign-ups booth out front that can help you do that, walk you through everything. So you can add your email, add your phone number, and then you can all be emailing and WhatsApping you know, very quickly. Uh, one of the things that we're very excited about as well is we do have a professional photographer out there. So if, like me, you haven't had a professional photo taken since before the pandemic and you look a little different now, you can please go out there. Um, our photographer will be out there all three days. We will have the photos available for you to use and update your sign offs profile as you go, but then they'll also be processed and we'll make those available to you later so you can use them however you like. Take pictures. Tweet, have fun, uh, send me photos. I think my number is, is around here everywhere. You have everyone's phone numbers. Send us photos of things that you enjoy. Post them on social media. Use our Instagram wall that's back there all set up. And please just, just have fun. And Graham, over to you to take us home. Take us home. Uh, last thing I want to do is go home. I'm having fun. Uh, before I do, I'm going to ask, and this is unscripted, and I've, uh, my apologies in advance to them. I'm going to ask um, each of the people, starting with Maria on screen, um, what they would think that success would look like from these two days. Because we've been talking about co-creation. We've been talking about what we want to do. That's great, and I, I'm really excited by it. But in practical terms, what would you like to see coming out of this? What, what, what would be a, a result for you? So as I say, start, I'm pointing at the screen here. You probably don't understand why I'm pointing at the floor. Um, 
Um, I would say to, to Maria, first of all, what would a, a successful payoff achieve, in your words? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Graham. I think for me, success, especially when we're talking about something, co-creation with multiple different stakeholders all coming with their own perspective, is to establish a, a level of understanding of each other's perspective, of respect, and also of trust. And, and I think Nicholas introduced the word safe haven earlier. And I think that in the next 48 hours, if you can all feel that you can bring your perspective, know that it's going to be respected and listened to, and that you bring that particular dimension to the discussion that then moves the discussion in a dynamic way that, that incorporates all the multi-stakeholder aspect. I think that for me would be one step towards success of this meeting. Thank you. That's, that's very powerful and it echoes some of the themes that were coming out earlier about the importance of being together to co-create. Thoughts from the panel? I just, I, okay. Oh, sorry, go. On, on you go, Laura. <laughs> okay. For me, it's just what I was saying earlier that I'd like to come away where I, the, the term equal truly is equal in action and not just word. So I think... In, in all ways, uh, I think when you, when you see representation around a table, you see experts and then it's patient expert. I just think it should all be experts and then people go into what that expertise is. So Good. that's for me. It, it's an expectation that I set for myself and for the community here. Um, don't leave a stranger. When you, at the end of these two days, don't be a stranger to the people in the room. I think that sort of mirrors what Maria was talking about. Make a friend, celebrate those differences, embrace those differences, and find a way to collaborate together for the problems of today and tomorrow. Don't be a stranger. Um, really embrace what we have here. Brilliant. Yes. Um, for me, I think the Mark introduced the idea of a movement, that we need to start creating a movement. I'd like to come away with that uh, sense that we've gone deep together um, and that we have budding common visions um, and an understanding of where the space could go and our parts in it collectively um, so that when we go away from here we all have some notion of what we individually can do, what action can move us collectively forward until, until the next iteration. Over the last 30 years, there have been milestones that have marked patient engagement. Uh, you go back to the HIV AIDS movement. Um, you see the creation of UPATI. You see IAPO's declaration on patient centricity. Uh, you see the patient community in the US putting together a strategy to get the FDA to do guidances on patient engagement. I'd like to know at the end of this meeting, what is the next element that is going to push patient engagement further along in the continuum uh, so that it is not just a tick box and that we are changing systems? Um, the end of the day, nobody should have health done to them. Health should be done with them. And if we can think through what is our, that next step, it's a great meeting for me. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to all the panel. Uh, thank you to the people who spoke on behalf of the co-organizers. And most of all, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, go off and co-create. Have as much fun as you can. I love your, your point, Stuart, about don't, don't be strangers. Get to know people. Get to build together. It's amazing the, the sparks that you can get from doing that. I'm really looking forward to the next two days. I'm sure you are. Let's go and have our 2.30, sorry, 3.30 session, which is due to start quite soon. And let's have a great time at PF 2022. Thanks, everyone.